Hello, it's Keith here, and this is lesson three of the so called Chibi Tracks assembly programming tutorials in Z80. So, we're looking at my, more of my uh, music player. Chibi Tracks is my multi platform, multi CPU um, soundtrack that you just heard there. We're going to be looking at the main code today. This is the code that is executed every interrupt or during the main loop, at least, when the music is being updated. It handles the updating of the pattern, reading in the pattern data, and also the instruments, changing the sounds that the channels are currently playing. So, let's go over to the code and and let's take a look. Okay, so here is the code, and this is what we're going to be looking at today. So at the start of every interrupt, we execute the Chibi Tracks play routine, as you can see here. Now we don't need to set any um, registers or anything to do this. All we need to do is, if we're running during an interrupt, is we need to back up the AF registers, H O D E B C and I X I Y, and the shadow registers are not used by Chibi Tracks, so it doesn't need too much. Now the first thing we're doing here is we're pointing I X to the start of of the channel information for the first channel. Channel state zero is the information for the first channel on the Z80. Each channel has 16 bytes, so we would add 16 to move to the next channel. We are also loading in the number of song channels, but that should always be three. Um, this hasn't been tested for any other number than three. So um, if you're trying to use a different number, then um, you, you might need to um, you might need to check it actually works. So we're going to use the B register as our counter here. We've got a D, J, and Z here at the end. And we're going to do two things for each of our channels. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to update the pattern. The first thing we do is we decrease the pattern time. Now this is the counter, the delay until the next line of the pattern. If this has reached zero, then we need to read in the next line of our pattern, and we will do that in the code we'll see in just a moment. Once we've updated our pattern, the other thing we do is we update our instrument. The first thing we do though is we check if an instrument is playing. A channel instrument time of zero means that the instrument is not playing, and in that case we will just skip over without doing anything. Otherwise, we decrease the counter, and if this is reached zero, we update our instrument. Now, this means processing the next line of our instrument data. As I say, uh, if we wanted our instrument to change immediately, we would set the time to one. If we set it to zero, that means that there is no instrument playing at all, and you saw that during the initialization. Now, that is the two things we do for each of our channels, and so we then increment by the channel data length, which is 16 bytes, and we, that moves us to the next channel, and we just repeat to update all of the channels, and then once we've done that, we then execute maybe the Chibi Sound Pro update. Now on some systems this is just a return command, but on systems like the ZX Spectrum which can't make a sound without constant int intervention by the processor, because the, the beeper we need to keep sending data to the sound, um, that update procedure will do that on those systems, but on some systems that's simply a return command. But that is the entire main loop, so in the hypothetical case where all of the patterns don't need updating this tick, their times are all greater than one, we would do nothing here, and if our instrument is not playing or the time delay is greater than one, we would do nothing here, and so we just have a simple loop and then a return. So in a minimal case, there is very little going on for an interrupt with um, the Chibi Track software, and the, the amount that happens when things need to be done just depends on what actually needs to be done. Okay, so the first possible thing is the reading of the pattern. In this case, what we're doing here is we're loading in the HL pair that is the pointer to the current line of the pattern that needs to be processed. What we then do is we load in the length of the delay for this line. That becomes the pattern time for the next instance instance. Now, if speed um, alterations are allowed, we're using speed multi here to up increase that. We will multiply it, whatever, whatever the speed is. And we then store this value in the pattern t, which is the time that we decreased here. So that is our counter for the delay for this line. We then increment HL and we run process sound commands, which will process a script for this line of the pattern. Now, if you remember, these scripts are theoretically identical for the patterns and the instruments, meaning it's the same code that processes both. But there's some commands that are only relevant to patterns, like an end of pattern command, and there's some commands that are only relevant to instruments you would expect. But in theory, you can you can do either command in either case if you wish. We're then storing the new pattern HL pair after we've processed our sound commands, and then we simply return. Update channel is similar. Here, we are loading in the HL pair that is the pointer to the instrument script uh, for this um, instrument. We load in the delay from the HL pair. If that is zero, then the instrument is being stopped. If it's not zero, then this is the speed, the, the delay for this line of the instrument. So we're storing that in channel instrument T here, the time for this instrument, and that is the same one that we were 
decrementing here so that is being loaded in there now as i say a value of zero is actually the last line of the instrument any other value is a delay that is the amount of time that this line will be processed now we're then running process sound commands which is the same script processor that we saw up here with regard with the with the patterns so as i say it's literally the same program code that is doing the job for both we then store the new address of the instrument um, script in HL pair into the current channel there. And we then are going to update Chibi Sound Pro. So we're loading in the new note and the new pitch here into E and A. We're then going to use that A and convert it to a 16-bit um, frequency using the tween tone command. We're going to look at that next lesson. Um, we've got some debug code here to show that value to the screen because sometimes it doesn't work. Sometimes there's bugs in this kind of code. And then what we're doing here is we are loading in the volume into H and we're loading in the channel number and the noise setting into L and we're running Chibi Sound Pro Set, which updates this channel's information. Now, there is a special case, of course, which was when the um, delay was zero. And in this case, we are going to stop the instrument. And this, what this does is it silences the channel. But it doesn't do it in a way that sets the volume of the channel to zero, because that would affect future instruments. If the current volume is 128, we want the next instrument to retain that volume unless it manually sets it itself. And so we're doing a kind of an override here. And we're forcing the volume that is passed to TB Sound Pro to be zero. So we're jumping here past this loading of H here, and we're overriding and loading H with a zero here. And that will silence the instrument when the instrument stops. That's how we're doing it. Okay, so you will notice that basically all the work is being done by this process sound commands, which is basically the script decoder for the um, scripts of the instruments and patterns. Now, you may remember before we looked at the um, source code for one of the songs, and um, the first byte, the two there, that is the delay, and then all of these other bytes here are the commands and the data for the line. And um, it's that kind of data that we're gonna see processed now. And so basically, the start of the script processor is this process some commands line here. Now, this is actually in the middle of some code, and the reason for this is that um, for the jump relatives to be most efficient and things, it's a, it was actually better to split half the code and move it above the start so that it could jump back um, with a JR rather than a JP. Just made the, commands, the program code a little bit smaller. So process sound commands here will load in the next byte from the stream in HL. And this will be effectively the command that we've got to process. So if this is a zero, then we've reached the end of the line. You will remember maybe that each of the lines ends in a zero. So a zero byte is an end of line, an, an end of script, and that will be immediately followed by a new delay. So you can see that here, we've got those delays there. So that's what is happening there. We will return in that case, there's nothing left to do. Otherwise, we're gonna to have to see what kind of command we've got. Now, the command bytes come in two forms. There's the commands where the command is a single nibble and the data is a single nibble. So the command and the data are stored in a single byte. The alternative is we have commands that use two bytes and the first byte is, is just the command. And then the second byte is the actual data for that command. Now, those kind of commands, the top nibble will always be zero. And so in this case, what we're doing here is we are processing the commands that just use a single nibble data value. And so we are basically masking the top nibble and re removing the bottom nibble altogether, although we've backed up our value into B. And then what we're going to do here is we're going to check, and if the top nibble is zero, then this is a multi-byte, a two-byte command. Otherwise, this is a one-byte command. And so what we're doing here is we're basically comparing, and if the top nibble is an F, then this is a volume command. If it's a D, then it's a pitch up. If it's an E, it's a pitch down. If it's a C, it's a noise command. And if it's one zero, then this is the pattern end, which is the command that happens at the end of every pattern. You can see one there. And the, the bottom nibble there actually doesn't do anything in the, for, in the current format of the program. So that is always just a single byte pattern end. Now this leaves a lot of other options available to you if you want to enhance this program. And uh, as I was saying in my tutorials, everything you can download on my website and you're welcome to enhance the software in any way you want and you can also download the tracker and you're welcome to enhance the tracker and you're welcome to use both of them commercially if you wish and can do so good luck to you that's what it's there for so um, these are the commands as they stand and we're going to see those in just a moment so in all of these cases what we're doing is we're getting the value from b and then we're masking the bottom nibble which is our data now in the case of a pitch down 
we are basically going to convert this to a signed number and we're loading that into the channel pitch here in IX. So this is a pitch shift effectively. Um, it's a one byte shift and so we're loading that in there. In the case of a pitch up, we're doing almost the same. We're just not doing that XOR and we're loading that in here into our pitch there. And so that is now a pitch up. Now this is our volume command and we're taking the bottom nibble here, but this is actually going to be a volume shift. And so what we're doing here is we're shifting the bit to the left, moving it effectively to the top, but then we're testing the top bit and we're seeing if this is a shift up in volume, making it louder or shift down, making it more quiet. So if the top bit is a zero, then this is an increase in volume because it's a positive number. And so we're effectively adding it to the current volume. But if the current volume has gone over 255, we're forcing it to be limited to 255. In the case that it's a volume down, we're adding what is now effectively a negative number. And this is making the volume go down. But again, if the volume has gone below zero, we are forcing the volume to zero here. So we're basically adding that as a, an offset to the current volume level. Now the noise command is a little bit odd and it's um, it kind of has a lot of space for improvement later. So you may be using it for other commands as well because basically only the bottom bit is used. Um, the command C0 effectively turns the noise off. The command C1 effectively turns the noise on and C2 to CF, they don't do anything. They don't really make any sense in the current format of the command. And so basically what we're doing here is we're getting the CNUM register here value here from the um, channel. Now this is the channel number, but the top bit is the noise status. So we're masking out that noise status, but keeping the channel number and we're storing that in C. We're then taking the bottom bit of our parameter that we've been passed, moving it to the top bit and we're oring it in. So basically that bit that's a zero there is being set to a one or a zero, depending on the value that was passed in the bottom nibble of this, com of this command. And we're then storing that new value back to CNUM. And as I say, this is effectively turning the noise on with a C1 command and all the noise off with a C0 command. Now, in all of these cases, once we've done that, we're then running process sound commands again to read in another byte and carry on po processing more instructions. So that's how we are dealing with the nibble commands. What about the multi byte commands? Well, multi byte is going all the way up here. As I say, um, this was done so that we could use more jump relatives and make the code a little bit shorter. So all of these will have the top nibble as zero because the top nibble that's not zero is a single byte command with a nibble parameter. Now in the case of all of these commands, these commands all take a second byte. And so we're loading that second byte here and loading it into C. So we're loading back in uh, B, the accumulator from B here, getting the original value back and we're branching to these various options here based on the bottom nibble. And again, we have some options here that aren't currently used. And so you're welcome to use those for your own commands if you want. So what options have we got? Well, byte note is specifying the note number. Now this is calculated into a frequency from the tweener, which we'll look at next time. So here we're just loading this new note into the channel settings. Volume is a one byte volume, an absolute volume, if you will. And we're loading that into the current channel volume. Pitch is an absolute pitch. So we're loading that into the channel's pitch. The pitch is basically a bend that is applied to the note. So the note frequency is calculated and then a bend can be applied to it to kind of shift from the current note to the next note in the octave. And this allows for um, sort of wavy notes and things like that. It's designed for um, it's designed in some ways to simulate the envelopes of the um, AY sound chip. It can give sim similar effects to um, some of the uh, things that that can do. We've got a loop command. Now this is a bit of a, a crude command, but effective if you use it right. Now with regards to the loop, what we're basically doing is we're going to add BC to the current byte address. And we've loaded in C before here. And so what this will effectively do is it will effectively jump us back to another part of the script. And we're going to just carry on processing whatever is at that position. The idea being that we should load a, a value in that jumps us back to a previous line within our script. And this can allow an infinitely looping um, sound effect. So I've got some wavy sounds that will play indefinitely until I want them to stop. And that's what this loop is for. But it's very crude. It's literally a byte offset. So if you load the wrong value in, you could load in and end up jumping to a, for example, maybe you've jumped to the um, time 
byte rather than an actual command and maybe that'll get misprocessed as actual data so you could get unpredictable results if your values are wrong but if it's right this should work quite well now with regards to looping sounds if you want to have a looping sound that starts and stops what you should do is you should have a, a sound that plays infinitely and play that for as long as you want the looping sound to occur and when you want it to stop you should have a silent instrument that you play and that will make that sound stop that's the way i've done it there's there's nothing more advanced that you can do or of course play a different instrument altogether but an, an, a looping instrument will play forever in chibi tracks it's it doesn't have um key down and key up key up is playing a silent instrument in effect okay now the final one we've got is the play instrument command and what this does is it um, instigates the playing of an instrument so we are going to force a new instrument to play you can see here we've got a call to a common F SFX module and what this is is um, if you want to forcibly play sound effects of your own for example I, in the Chibi Fighter game I had punches and kicks that were actually just instruments and so um, you can create your own module that basically does this job and call it common SFX and um, this code will run that rather than duplicating what is effectively the same code in an alternate place in your program. So just an option there. So basically what we're doing here is we are effectively um, multiplying the C byte that was loaded in by two here and loading in an offset in the instrument list, loading in the address of that instrument. And then we are setting the time to one, which means that it's going to update immediately. And then basically, um, then all we're doing here is we're calculating any offset of the instrument address. This is the address of the script that we're going to process in our instrument next time. And um, we're storing that in channel instrument L and H here or offsetting it if required here. Now, once we've done that, we're basically just then going back and processing more commands. Actually, I'm just noticing there, and um, process sound command is right here. We could run that out and maybe save two bytes of our code there. Wait, let's do that now. I keep no whenever I do these, the more times I look at the code, the more times I find slight improvements that can be made without reducing the functionality. So, um, uh, re, re document making these tutorials and repeatedly re looking at the code over and over again, I do. Yeah, that seems to still work okay so uh, looking at this code over and over again does it, i do often notice things that can be improved and corrected and so um you know, making these tutorials and things it does help improve the code in both in terms of documentation but in terms of in optimization and finding bugs and things so it's always it's always um, very beneficial anyway as i said before you can go to my website download the bill scripts and the examples and all of that kind of thing and if we all to do anything with it you can we're going to be coming back next time to look at the tweening code that handles the calculations of frequencies and um, there's some mo some fractional code to um, calculate um, 16 fractions in between two notes for the pitch bends anyway i hope you've enjoyed what you've seen today thanks for watching and goodbye